Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion called Letting Curiosity Guide Your Languages. I am Heidi Lovejoy, the creator and host of Lovejoy and Languages podcast. And I am here with El Sharice and Emily Richardson. Would you all like to take a moment to introduce yourselves? Emily? Okay, I am Emily. I'm the host of the Language Confidence Project daily podcast, which is five to 10 minutes of language encouragement to help you get through all the mental, physical and emotional barriers to language learning. And I'm Elle Sharice. I'm the host of Speaking Tongues podcast, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. And I speak to people every week on Mondays about their languages. I speak to people from all over the world about their languages that they speak and the cultures that are surrounding those languages. So thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited to be here together. And um, just give you a, a heads up, this is just really a free and open conversation between the three of us. We really hope that you guys have some questions, put them in the chat at any time as they pop up on the screen for us. We'll uh, get to them as soon as we, you know, have a little bit of a pause in the conversation. But I kind of wanted to to do this, I thought about doing this because in the last, I don't know, year or so of my language learning, I've seen a really big shift in how I approach, especially my language time and how I feel like I can approach my languages. It's shifted a lot from the prescriptive, like the I learn what's in front of me. I learn the language as it comes to me in a program or a textbook or an app or or just however it comes to me, instead of feeling like I'm in control of it. And I had this shift and it wasn't intentional, but it's gone a lot toward just seeking out what I want in the language, whether it be a specific grammar point that like I know I need to be studying because the subjunctive is everywhere and so I should be doing it, or because I'm reading something and I see a word I don't understand, or I see a word I do understand, but I've never heard it before. And then I go into the etymology of it and, oh, this is tied to this other word in another language. And doing this has made my language learning a lot more enjoyable, a lot less stressful for me. And I feel like it's guided more by me and what I really want to learn. And so I just really wanted to talk about that and share that. And I brought on Elle and Emily because we all kind of intersect in a really interesting way. Um, so first I'll come to Emily. And after hearing what I just said about kind of my shift in, in how I just more seek out what I want, how is this different maybe from how you approach language learning from a point of being curious or from a point of letting the language come to you? So I contacted Heidi months ago about this exact issue because for me, um, there's a lot of talk in the language world about new and shiny syndrome, this whole idea of being pulled in all these different directions by your curiosity and finding all these, almost like a treasure hunt of this looks amazing and this looks interesting. I don't have that. For me, curiosity is something I've really had to grow into from a place of risk aversion. So for me, the, the advice I always needed was never, how do I get past new and shiny syndrome? It was how do I approach new things, whether it be a language or something like an app, a new kind of course set up? How do I approach anything new from a place of curiosity rather than from a place of anxiety? Hmm. And so we thought that could be a really interesting sort of the other side of the coin to this conversation. Yeah, I'm like really, I'm outgoing when it comes to resources, but also in the, the less healthy way of being a resource hoarder. But when I identified that I'm like that and now I have to hold myself back, like, do I really need this resource or will it really add something to me? And usually the answer is no. Usually I have everything I need. But then for me, it's really easy for me to be like, okay, how can I dig into this textbook that I have and start letting my curiosity for this subject that I thought I wanted this other resource, but how can I be curious enough to dig into and like take from this resource, everything that I can. And Emily, you're more really risk averse. You, you question yourself a lot and really, really dig into the, the idea of that, of, of new resources, new things. 
Elle, where do you see yourself in this sense? Do you have any sort of like personal ways you do things or habitual ways or personality things that would tie into how you see these types of things? Yeah, um, for me, just I'm just a naturally curious person and I've always been a traveler. I've always been um, a map geography nerd and looking at you know maps and atlases in different parts of the world and i've always been curious about what's going on in places that i can't see what's going on in other parts of the world um, what are people doing every day what are they celebrating and i live in new york city and there are so many expressions of culture here there are so many expressions of language here and i feel like growing up here that definitely fed into my curiosity and realizing that I could get on the train and go a few stops and be in a neighborhood of people who speak Nepali or people who speak Tagalog or Mandarin Chinese. And so having that proximity to language and especially having that proximity to culture. And now that New York City is starting to celebrate more holidays, um, uh, Lunar New Year, Diwali, things like that, um, so we're all getting an, an up close glimpse of some of our neighbors and their communities and what they celebrate. And so I've always been very curious about that. I've always loved languages. And so um, for me, that's a very big part of it. And, and wanting to communicate with my neighbors, wanting to help, wanting to, um, to share the culture, because I think culture is meant to be shared. Um, and so... Um, that's kind of where my curiosity is. It's a little global. It's a little all all over the world and unstructured, um, but it's definitely an extension of me. And I always try to put that out there when I'm approaching learning a language. I feel like living somewhere like New York City, you just it would be so hard not to want to learn languages <laughs> as people like us, especially because, like you said, it's all around you and it's not just a language. You get the cultures and you get some food and mm -hmm. seeing different ways people dress and interact with each other. There's so much eavesdropping when you're on the train and you hear something like, wait, I think I know that word and I want to know. But then you don't want to approach people and make them feel weird and um, make them feel othered in a kind of way. But it is fun to just kind of hear this that that multilingual soundscape in New York is very prevalent. Yeah. I'm going to pull out a, a comment that I see over here in the chat um, because I think it's interesting, something that we've, the three of us have talked about behind the scenes before. So Mika, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, says, I'm autistic, so I'm always torn between curiosity and a need for a reliable structure. And this is something that we've all talked about a bit because I like reliable structure, but I've been able to kind of let my curiosity more take over how I do my study time. And Emily is more reliable structure, likes yeah. knowing and anticipating what's yeah. coming on. I also have a diagnosis of autism. Yeah. Um, it's, I it's, don't know if that's relevant, but it, it certainly could f sort of form a, a sort of constellation of yeah. quite sensible traits and behaviors. Being able to have the structure that you know you can rely on, that you know you can come back to without needing necessarily to let mm -hmm. outside things influence or, or impact your, your language learning. So how have you, Emily, you said you need to figure out or you have sort of sought out ways to allow yourself to be curious while also mm -hmm. feeling that stability of the structure. Yeah. Is there anything that, that you could speak to here that maybe that you've done or thought about or read that helps you kind of balance those two things? This has been an entire light section of the journey of the Language Confidence Project, very much a case of how do we stay in our comfort zone enough that it is something that feels okay and doesn't exhaust us and doesn't drain us, but at the same time, gently pushing from a place that we're already comfortable in. So it's not about like catapulting ourselves to a realm way beyond our comfort zone and jumping into a whole new thing. Because I know that some people love the opportunity to do that. They're like, yes, salsa class, yes, please. Or yes, DJ tuition, I'd love that. I've never been able to do that. And there's a lot less advice out there for people who I think feel that way. 
So it's been a real case of, okay, how can I take all the things that I am comfortable with right now that feel like they're well in my comfort zone and just slightly alter them um, or take 90% of what I'm comfortable with and put it in a new environment, but where everything looks really familiar. And it's really been about getting that balance. Um, so a primary example right now would be moving from podcast to YouTube, I am using all of the same, um, literally my YouTube episodes are my podcast episodes so that I'm taking everything I already have and the equipment changes, the environment actually doesn't change. I'm recording in exactly the same space. And so it's all about, okay, these bits are different, but all of this is similar and look how that works for my like nervous system. That's really interesting. I can see how, yeah, allowing yourself to be in a space or, or using resources or whatever it is that's comfortable for you, but taking them just one step out outside mm -hmm. of that that way yeah. that you do things. And it's very different, L, how you experience just the world in general. How does your inspiration comes from all around you? It sounds like you can just step outside of your house and, <laughs> and there's language and cultural inspiration around you. Maybe you got to go a few blocks. But how does that come into play when you're like actual study time? Do you ever just go out and experience some some food or hear a conversation on the train and you're like, oh, I really just want to get back to this language because I recognize those words and now I want to come back and like be able to understand more. Yeah, I think that has happened for me. Um, I'm in this space where I'm very aware of, you know, creating this podcast and coming into contact with with different languages on a weekly basis. So I've really had to rein myself in when it comes to, um, I may feel so excited to wanna to learn something, but then I realized that um, that goal of wanting to be fluent or wanting to converse in the language, I have to say to myself, do I really need this? Do I really want this? Is this gonna fit in with my schedule? And I've, I've really had to you know, come to um, rein myself in. Um, and I can go, like you said, I can go out of my house. I can go in my hallway. And I was, I heard my neighbors just now and I'm doing like a mental scan. I have Russian, I have Yiddish, I have Armenian, I have Mandarin and I have Spanish, uh, just in my hallway, like on my neighbors. So it's like hearing them in the hallway too, makes me say like, is this time for me to learn Russian? Is this time for me to learn a little of uh, Mandarin? But um, it, it is easy to do that. I've taken, um, I have someone in my neighborhood who's who's feeding me a little bit of Mandarin every time I see her. Um, I have a neighbor who's feeding me a little bit of Russian every time I see her. But then I have to also realize to myself how, for my lifestyle, how useful is this for me? And I have to kind of tell myself like, it's okay for me to get to a point where I feel like I can, I can greet someone, I can, I can maybe count very basically. Um, maybe I can very basically express myself or just ask someone, you know, how they're doing or understand if they're asking me how they're doing. So that fits more into my lifestyle right now. Um, just kind of getting an overview of the different basics. And I feel like that's just enough of a dopamine hit to make me feel like I'm being effective and like I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm being productive and I'm, I'm being helpful and I'm learning. So um, I have had those experiences and they've been wonderful. Yeah. The, especially just, just taking it all in around you. This actually kind of ties in really good with a question that we just got. And it says, I've learned about Steve Kaufman's advice not to focus too hard on studying grammatical structures, rather learn them by reading and listening. Does that approach work for those of you who like learning through structure? So I'm going to answer first because I've been thinking about this a whole lot lately. I actually love grammar. I could just study nothing but grammar and then the vocab just kind of comes because I really... Um, I think it comes because I have a mathematical brain and I have a scientific brain. And so I really like putting all those pieces together. But I also really enjoy when I come across grammar in 
reading or listening to something. And so for me, I find a really good balance between the input, all the input that I I use the input really as a basis for that curiosity. Okay, why did they use that participle there? Oh, I didn't, what is this, the, the past participle of? Why did they use the dative case there? And from hearing that in context, I can then pull it out and go study it. And for me, that works really well. Or the opposite way, if I'm studying a very specific grammar point, now I've gone out after I've studied it, I go and take in a lot of input and then I see it in real life. So it's kind of like curating the experience of the repetition. So for me, it goes really hand in hand. I love studying grammar and I love finding it in the wild and understanding kind of the background of why it works. But Emily, someone like you, who also likes a really structured kind of way of learning, how do you feel about grammar via just input and grammar via studying it? I just had a sort of mental scan of this in my learning experiences. And I think what I'm going to say might sound completely odd based on what I've just said. But my background, so I started learning languages in a very academic way. I studied French and linguistics at Oxford, and it was very, very regimented. And I then self-taught um, Spanish through textbooks. And I've then spent time teaching those languages too. And then I learned Portuguese with no formal studying at all. So only through speaking and listening and watching, but no textbook, absolutely no grammar exercises. And what I found was that the very structured learning of a curriculum, regardless of what the curriculum was and whether it was imposed by me, i.e. in my Spanish learning or by the institution in my French learning, the numbers and that kind of structure was the wrong kind of structure because it invited perfectionism in. It was all about how are you scoring? Did you get these right? And that was what I found didn't work for me in language learning. So the structure I was comfortable in was in daily language exchanges with people who I'd met online on Tandem and on Instagram. I spoke to a lot of people that way as well. And every day was, again, structured. We'd got a topic agreed in advance. We had a system in place, but it most certainly was not at any point numerical. Nobody could say, did you get this right? Didn't you? Did you get a certain percentage out of whatever? There was no daily streak. And that was the structure I needed to make for myself to really feel like my language learning was my own. And I loved what you just said, Heidi, about finding grammar structures in the wild. Um, I think for me, that is what I want out of my language learning wherever possible, because it takes away that thing of, but how how good are you at this structure? You know, did you did you get the right marks? And then it it takes away the inner voice. So um, yeah, that is how I would say too. I focus on finding it in the wild rather than um, focusing on the structures themselves. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because when I think of structured language learning, I think routine. I think mm -hmm. I wake up, I get my coffee, I spend 15 minutes on Enki, I spend 15 minutes here. Yeah. And I've tried that before and for me it doesn't work. But you've made a great point that structure isn't what everyone says in, a, in some block. It's your structure, something that you personally can rely on. And I mean, I guess I, I really do have a very structured way of learning. It's just not what anyone would consider regimented, I guess you could say. Like, I have to, to do these types of activities in this way. Um, and that's a really, yeah. I think, permissive way of looking at it. Yeah, you're building a language home, right? Not a language prison. And it's it, all that difference <laughs> is about what feels right and where there are the windows and doors for when actually it gets a bit too much and mm -hmm. not feeling like you're blocked into things that you don't want to do yeah. or that don't feel right. Yeah. Well, speaking of not feeling right or feeling like too much, our next question has come in. <laughs> and this is one is for L. L, your city seems ideal for learning a language. Are there any downsides at all to learning languages slash being exposed to languages in a big city? That is a great question. Um, I would say the downsides of it 
for someone like me who is very curious is just, it can be overwhelming because you want to make these connections. You want to have the time and the ability to, you know, think about, you know, if you're, if you're out on the subway and you see something in Bengali and which is one of the most spoken languages here, you might think, okay, I, I think I want to learn some, but then, you know, very onto the next platform or on the next train, then you see a completely different language or you hear a completely different language. And I think it can be overwhelming because you get to the point where you realize that life only gives you but so much time. And then you really can't, um, you really may not have the opportunity to take it all in as you wish that you could. Um, I think that, um, being exposed to different languages, I don't, I, I don't see the downsides of it personally. Um, I think it's wonderful. And I think having been here my whole life, I'm seeing more bilingual expressions and more multilingual expressions here and more, um, what feels to me like, um, acceptance of others and welcoming of others into different communities and sharing that culture, which I think in a city of, you know, 9 million and plus in the metro area, I think that's really, really important to getting to understand that um, we all come from different corners of the globe here and we're all here for the same reason. And just because we speak different languages and we celebrate different things and we eat different foods or wear different clothes, uh, we're all human. And I think it it greatly um, lends itself to empathy building and to um, and to community building. So I personally don't see the downside aside from if you're someone who wants to learn um, all these languages and just feels very inspired at the drop of a hat like I do um, or I can be. Um, maybe that's it. It's just a it's a battle of time. It's more <laughs> it's more a, an issue of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this makes me think of language dabbling, of course. Mm -hmm. So Emily and Elle, do either of you tend to dabble in languages here and there, just pick up a little at a time? Historically, I have done that when I thought that, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to do that in my life. That was my goal to kind of dabble. But for many years, I just stuck to two languages and tried to get as good as I can in both of them. But now this year I'm back to dabbling because I've dabbled in Cantonese and Mandarin and I'm about to start a Cherokee language class in a week. I'm so excited. So I'm kind of like re-embracing dabbling and just letting that, you know, as we're talking about leading with curiosity into just trying something um, that I never thought I'd have the opportunity to do. So um, I'm embracing it again. <laughs> and Emily, you're definitely know you need your language to be a, a language that you commit yeah, yourself to. Yeah, I tend, I mean, I have occasionally, like when I went, I did a two week course in Norway for language, mind and brain. So I looked up some phrases that I might need in Norway. That was okay, but in terms of, I, I tend to go into a language expecting to be fully in it for two or three years before I would move into another one. Because mm -hmm. again, dabbling means being new at something too often. <laughs> um, it doesn't feel comfortable until it gets to the point where it feels like I can, I want to feel familiar in it. So by the time I've got to the point where I feel, feel familiar in it, well, I may as well carry on with it because I like it. You know, yeah. um, I wanted to ask you a question, Heidi, because I've seen your talks previously on perfectionism. And I was wondering whether for you, curiosity, bringing in more curiosity has been a way to kind of override perfectionism or whether you feel more like by recognizing the perfectionist traits there has been more space for the curiosity to just fill in the gaps kind of which one is driving which I think I think the curiosity has I don't say driven out but is driving out the perfectionist tendencies because both of them actually come from the same place in me both of them come from a place of 
uh, truly just wanting to use my brain. Like that's mm -hmm. really it. I've always been curious about the world and about science and about things that stimulate my brain. And the perfectionist route came from just not feeling good enough, not feeling smart enough and needing to prove myself even to just myself that I am good enough. And so all of that manifested into this negative kind of way of functioning. But curiosity has come in probably because I decided to start facing this perfectionism and just realizing how it shows up and trying to figure out how to work with it. Then it kind of it didn't go away, but it's like managed enough that there's room for that that part of my brain that says I want to know more now to flourish and now mm -hmm. to start taking over. And I can explore all the things about the languages that I want, not because I feel like I have to, because I have to know the subjunctive. If I want to speak perfect Italian, if I want to sound like an Italian, if I want to impress all the other Italians I'm talking to, I have to know this. It's coming from a why do they even have that? How do they use it in the different ways? Why did they use that here? Why did they use the conditional here instead of the subjunctive? And answering those questions then teaches me that grammar point without it being something I must do because mm -hmm. this grammar book tells me I have to do it. And in the end, the result is that I learn it in both ways. But one, I res learn it from resistance yeah. because I have to. And one, I learn it because I, I want to. And it's a very different outlook um, on both of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question here that I'm going to run to real quick. Uh, and I guess this one's more for Elle again. Would you recommend to move to New York or any other global super city where it's easy to encounter languages for someone on the spectrum, followed by highly subjective, I guess? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, that's a great question. I. I'll be honest, I don't feel comfortable ask, answering a question about a, um, a spectrum or a diagnosis that I personally am not familiar with and I haven't received. So I don't want to step into your shoes and imagine what it would be like for you um, with autism. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me and respect that I, I just, there's so much that I don't know about autism and I, I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, but I can address moving to a global city or a large city. <clears throat> excuse me, in general. Um, I've been here my whole life, so I think I'm perfect to answer this question. Um, I think that in New York City, it's great to visit. I don't and I don't really recommend anyone to move here because it's, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot going on and I won't get into that, but um, I do definitely recommend that everybody come and visit. And I think when coming to visit, I think that you can hear a lot of languages here, obviously. Um, what I think the downsides of that can be, and this was actually brought to my attention through someone on my show, on uh, my podcast, is that um, you do run the risk of, you know, you come here and you want to hear languages or you want to practice your language, and that's great. And I think that um, it's always a good idea to, you know, to feel confident to want to practice your language with people who speak it and, and you're hearing it. But I think also there runs the risk because there are so many people here from different places. I think you do run the risk of maybe incorrectly assuming that someone speaks a certain language when they, when they don't and they speak another. Um, and then that leads to or can lead to some issues of identity and people feeling othered or people feeling singled out. Um, and so it's kind of a tricky line to walk, especially when you're going up to strangers and you don't know their background, you don't know their particular um, desire for wanting to speak their language with people who don't look like them or people who um, don't have the same cultural identity as them or, um, you know, language does have a lot to do with identity as well, especially when you're living in the city and you are maybe um, an immigrant to the city um, or you are, you know, someone who's moved here from another part of uh, the country or another part of the state. So I think that there are identity issues in combination with the language, especially in a big city, because everybody's here. We're all here for the same reason to like make money and take care of our family. And you can you know, you can definitely make more money in a big city, but, um, you know, there are other reasons that people come to the city and that's not always as readily seen when you're just talking to someone very superficially. So there are, there are upsides and downsides of, um, just kind of 
talking with with strangers about you know the language that you perceive that they speak. Um, so there there's a lot to consider. All stuff that I talk about on my show too, because I I don't really feel like you can necessarily take language and separate it from its identity and the identities of the people who who use their language um, so readily. So yeah. we have another question in that I'm going to pause. I'm going to come to in just a moment, it switches gears. But before I do that, I want to kind of highlight the point that you also made is that especially as curious people, especially as people who love languages, like we legitimately want to know more about people's experiences and about people's lives and where they come from. But that hits the crossroad of humanity and respecting other people's boundaries and other people's desire or not desire to tell their story. It's their story to tell and being able to find that I'm going to call it a sweet spot, but that area where you can be in a safe space to have conversations like you hold space for on your show, especially is, is truly fantastic. But to be curious while being respectful completely of other people's experiences, boundaries is um, it's an interesting place where your curiosity and, and humanity, especially cross over. Yeah. And I think it can be hard for a lot of people um, who may feel they don't feel safe to speak in their languages here because some people in this country do have the attitude of you're in America, you need to speak English. And so people want to not, you know, when you're asking someone about their language, I've noticed that some people that I've encountered just are like, why, why do you ask? Why do you want to know? And, it, and I, I want to know because I'm curious and I want to learn so much about them, but I can only imagine what they're going through in their head thinking maybe the last person who asked me this wanted to discriminate against me or maybe they wanted to exclude me from something and so like you said you know a sweet spot there there is kind of a it, it can be tricky to walk that line and try to um you know because it is such a part of so many people's identities um and i think it's just very important to be respectful of that yeah for sure so we're going to switch gears if you guys want more on this particular topic, again, El Show, she does a great job of walking that line, asking the questions in a safe space and, and highly recommend it. So the next question, um, either of you can answer this or I can if you all don't know, how do you feel about being at a polyglot gathering? Does it motivate you to become better at languages when hearing people who are better than you or does it feel demotivating? Do either of you have a response? I can take that one sure. first, if, if you don't mind. Um, so this goes back to why my Portuguese method worked so much better for me than previously. And that is that every day, and now it's less, it's like twice, three times a week, I speak to my people in Portuguese. We do our language exchange. I know that I'm helping them in their English and I am there to just be their friend in Portuguese. And we talk about all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And the reason that works is because it's now irrelevant whether other people are better or less good than me at Portuguese. Because, okay, they might have, you know, wider vocabularies, better grammar, have a certification that I don't have, any of that. But none of that would immediately mean that they would be better suited to help my people than I am. And so it's sort of like, well, yeah, okay, they are better, they're further along their journey, whatever that might be. But my Portuguese has a job to do and it does that job beautifully and it makes people feel good. And that's what it's there for. So whether my Portuguese were to get worse if I stopped speaking it for a bit, whether it would be to get better, or whether it be to stay the same, it's doing a really good job. So I can almost crowd out what everybody else is doing in a way that I could never have done when we were all being pitched together in exams and working through a textbook. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very much, I, I, I don't know that it's motivating or demotivating, it just is. I think being in this space has helped me realize that all the other language learners aren't so different than me. They're not so better than me. They just exist and they just are. And, um, 
and it helps me think, okay, what are they doing or what have they done? Is that something that would work for me? Maybe I try it out. Maybe I don't. Maybe it works for a little while. Maybe it, it doesn't. Um, I think as a speaker at a conference like this, it has one helped reduce imposter syndrome because now I've done it more times and I feel, I feel better, but it really does motivate me more for languages, not in a comparative way, but just like we're in this space and we're talking about it. And so now after I talk about it, I want to go and talk to more people that I met at the conferences with the languages and, um, and just really dig into being there. Like the motivation for languages after something like this is, is also really, really high for me. So we have two more questions that now came in. We're right at the 10 minute mark, 10 minutes left. So we're going to answer these as any others come in, we will. And then I have a couple more for you all real quick. If we have a couple more minutes at the end. <laughs> all right. So back to curiosity about lots of languages. L, oh. do you have preferred ways of asking people about their language? I've been taken to saying things like, pardon my curiosity, your language sounds really cool. What is it? Do you have something that's worked for you? Yeah, that's that's usually what I would ask somebody or just, um, you know, just, I think what helps me in New York City is that, um, there's always so much to look at and there's, you kind of get a sense as you're moving through the city. Um, and you know, we've been here for a while. So I've gone up to people and I've asked them just something else, like I've complimented their shoes or their hat or something like that. Or I've asked them for directions, even though I know where I'm going. And then I get like, I don't want to say I try to get a smile on their face, but I try to get a gauge of like, are they in the mood for a little chit chat or something like that? And then it's like, oh, um, where are you from? Or are you, what part of the city are you from? Or where, you know, just kind of easing into that. I don't, I think I'm generally, <laughs> believe it or not, I think I'm, I'm still a little shy sometimes. And I think I have moments where I'm more shyer than others. So I, I don't feel comfortable just, you know, going straight in. I like to kind of, like, you know, a cup of tea, you know, you get your tea bag and you ease it into the cup kind of thing and ease it into hot water. Um, but I think that that's always been helpful for me, um, just kind of diverting completely and just, you know, oh, I really, I love your bag or your coat's really cool or I love your glasses or something. And then when I hear them, oh, by the way, and I feel like that kind of opens a, a segue. So I, I go with the distraction method and then I um, I go and, and ask my questions if I feel like the person might be up for a little chit chat. But at the heart of that is seeing the humanity of the person first, something about them as a human being, not just where are you from? What does that yeah, mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's a way of, you know, just where are you from? Isn't it? That's an interrogation. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. <laughs> exactly. Next question that came in, I'm going to take this one because, because I've thought about this a lot lately. Um, <laughs> I always get really excited about new languages I encounter, leading me to learn lots of a language, uh, lots of languages, a little bit, and hardly any in depth. Do you have experiences like that? How do you deal with this? So this is really at the heart of the dabbling question that when Elle talks about all the languages around her, like as soon as I meet someone who speaks a new language or a language that's new to me, I'm like, mm, I'm going to start learning. How do you say hello? And thank you. And it just starts there. And I've dealt with this by one, allowing it, because if I don't allow it, I'm going to find myself only thinking about that language. Like recently, well, a few months ago, I started dabbling in Danish because I got an email from Chris Burholm, who's talking about his Danish stuff. And I was like, what does this language sound like? I want to learn a little bit. It is so fascinating. So I do it for a while. And instead of just like spending all my time with Danish now and just like really honing in on that, I allow myself a little bit a day, take it in. It's got some really cool grammar stuff. I'm like, that's really neat. I like that. But then when that motivation kind of started to go down and I'm not taking it anywhere. I need to be focusing on German because I live in Germany. I need to be focusing on Italian. I'm studying for my B2 exam. How can this fit in? And how can I kind of put it in a place that still supports my main languages? And this is something that I've kind of 
I guess gotten really good at maybe is, and it goes back to that curiosity. I see this word in Danish that looks very much like a German word. And that kind of like makes my motivation for German go up. And a lot of times I'll dabble in a language because my motivation is really low in my main languages or I'm feeling really burned out. But the dabbling and going off to the side and just learning a little bit of something, especially if I can now say thank you in, I don't know, Russian to my neighbor or whatever, if I can say those words, it gives me just enough happiness that I just love languages. And so the burnout from the actual languages I'm learning starts to lessen a little bit faster. If I ignore the language that I kind of want to dabble in, uh, it's just going to, that desire is going to get stronger and I won't be able to focus. But then finding connections between those languages and the ones that I already speak, that I already uh, am learning more intensively, makes me really excited to come back to them. So. Mm -hmm just kind of weaving in and out, taking those side steps. I sidestepped in French for a little bit. And of course, then I'm like, ah, back to Italian. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun. And they're so light and joyful that it just, it just helps come back. I have a kind of part two question for you, Dabblers, which is how do you feel about um, language, con like contained language challenges? So like I'll dabble for seven days of intensive Danish or, you know, I will spend a weekend on my Cantonese. Do you feel like for you, it's just something you play in and then naturally come out? Or do you feel the need to like put it in a box and say, we do it for this amount of time? No, because as soon as I say I'm going to do it for that amount of time, I will automatically no longer want to do it. If I, if I set any limits to it, yeah. it, it won't happen. If I just let it happen freely, it's a lot, it's a lot easier for me. For me, dabbling, I like to take a class if I can. Like mm -hmm. I took a class in Easy Zulu uh, two years ago. And just because I was curious from an episode that we had on the show, and I realized there's so many sounds that I'm not familiar with at all. And then I saw that the teacher was offering this class. I said, yes, I'm gonna do it because I wanna understand how those sounds feel. And I wanna understand um, how they're making these sounds. And that was really important to me. Um, but I only ended up taking the class for about six weeks, seven weeks. Um, so that, you know, I plan to continue, but that was at this moment, that was my dabble moment in, in the language taking a class and it was it felt better for me than just going through duolingo or going through you know a short very quick sprint yeah well we are down to three minutes now so would you like each to take one minute we'll each take one minute to have parting words throw out your show talk anything else about where people can find you all or us or how do you want to leave people being curious about languages in the next couple minutes Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you can find my show pretty much anywhere. Um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. It's called Speaking Tongues. Um, we talk about language. We talk about culture. We talk about food. Um, and we also, in some episodes, talk about identity and um, pretty much anything else my guest wants to talk about as it relates to language. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on uh, X, Twitter, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to connecting with more people and hearing more about your languages and your cultures. Emily. And you can find me at the Language Confidence Project on any podcasting apps you use. And also as of last week on YouTube, I'm putting video episodes up, all 275 of them. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Yeah, you can find me there. And I'm on Instagram at, at T with Emily as well. Podcast episodes are five to 10 minutes and they come out every weekday. And I am Love, Joy and Languages podcast, also found all over any podcast place. Um, I don't even remember my Instagram and X, so it's linked to my podcast somewhere if you guys come find me. Um, I highly recommend just getting out there and seeing your language, seeing how you can connect with it or with other people, because all of those things that you're you're wondering about, just let yourself go and explore them. And it's exciting. And and it just kind of brings it all together. And the, I feel like the more curious we are and the more we go after that curiosity, the more successful that we are because we're, we're experiencing it and making it our own. So thank you, everyone, so thank very you. much for being here. 
And thank you so you. much for inviting us. It's been Absolutely. I've been so excited to have this conversation with you both. Excellent. It's been mm -hmm. wonderful. And we will see you guys out there. Thank <laughs> you.